Hi, I'm Mark Victor Hansen, co-author and creator of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series and the One Minute Millionaire series, The Enlightened Way to Wealth. You're watching my friend Philippe Matthews' show. Don't miss it. In 1997, history was made when the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad was co-authored by Robert Kiyosaki and Sharon Lecter. Still making history and still authoring books, Robert sat down with me during a recent trip to Chicago to discuss his passion for educating people on building wealth and, more importantly, sustaining wealth. This and more is up next on The Philippe Matthews Show. Welcome to the Philippe Matthews Show. I'm sitting here with an actual legend. I'm sitting here with Robert Kiyosaki, the man who produced uh, a publishing phenomenon and a wealth building phenomenon called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Robert, thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you. Uh, 1997, here is this concept, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. A poor, you know, you're, you're getting advice from your, your poor dad, and you're getting advice from this kind of surrogate father who is very wealthy. Did you ever see this coming? <laughs> Where you're selling out Madison Square Garden, I mean, everywhere you go, you're kind of rushed like, you know, Michael Jackson. Well, I guess that's not necessarily a good thing. But <laughs> you get the idea. Where, were you prepared for this level of success? No, I don't. No, I just, I just feel extremely lucky and blessed. And, uh, but it's also, you know, spiritual. It, yeah. uh, I don't have to work anymore. I mean, if I made no more money, I'd be fine for the mm -hmm. rest of my life. And sometimes I wonder why I do this, why do I keep going, but there really is some kind of a, a drive and a mission. Like I said, I feel blessed, I feel lucky, and I'm just grateful for all the wonderful things that have happened. Yes, yes. Now, I, I heard that a phenomenon uh, uh, occurred that has never happened in the publishing industry ever before. I believe it came from Warner Brothers, who, who publishes your books. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, well, it's been on the New York Times bestsellers list since the arrival of it in 1997, so it's never left. But the phenomenon is it went back to number one. That's correct. That's nuts. I know. That's insane. It's a, <laughs> it's a, How does that happen? You're reaching, obviously, an entire new flock of people yeah. for it to come back to number one. My God. And after seven years, it's, you know, it's, it's been on there three weeks now. Yeah. And uh, that is unheard of. And it just sh shows the power of, I guess, viral marketing or people <laughs> telling their friends because it's sure not my marketing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into some meat and potatoes here. Why are you so passionate about this message of self-wealth? Um, I, I guess it goes back a long ways. I was always kind of interested in money as a kid. Mm -hmm. But in my family, uh, it was a taboo, you know, like in our family we're all educators, we're all PhDs mm -hmm. or MBAs and all that other stuff, we're professional people. And to speak about money was uh, dirty, it was a sin. Mm. And when I, and I went along and I went, you know, I graduated from school, I went to school in New York, from mm -hmm. graduated from Hawaii, I went to school in New York and then I had a high paying job. So mm -hmm. I've always been able to make money but something always didn't satisfy me with mm -hmm. just money. And then the Vietnam War was on in 1969, and mm -hmm. I quit my high-paying job with Standard Oil of California. I was driving tankers for them as a ship's officer. Mm. And I quit that job to go join the Marine Corps. So I went from making like you know 5,000 a month down to, I think, 200 a month. Oh, wow. You know, and you know that, that football player, Pat Tillman, he yes. was just killed in Afghanistan. Yes. It's that same, you know, when I read his story in Time Magazine, that same story, it's a sense of duty, yeah. it's a sense of obligation, it's a sense of responsibility. Yes. So rather than, and I was draft exempt because I was sailing on oil ships, you know, the, mm. the Bush Brothers oil ships, you know I say. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you're driving oil, you don't have to you're go okay, to war. You're okay, yeah. you're fine. Yeah, you're fine, man. You can get draft you're exempt, safe. you know, you write your own <laughs> ticket. As long as with oil, you're okay. You're bad. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to free TV. I know. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't hang me now. You know? No, 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 no. So anyway, um... And so I volunteered, and my dad just cried. You know, my mm. poor, my poor dad, my school teacher yeah. dad, because I was a horrible student in school. And I finally make, I get the high-paying job with the big corporation, and I quit, and I go to Vietnam to go fight, and you know, I, drew, I flew helicopters in Vietnam. I was 
I was a Marine pilot. And it was out there I kind of started to grow up mm. because um, I don't believe most of what I read in the press anymore. Mm. And it started in Vietnam when I realized that we were being lied to. Mm. Or not so much lied to, we just weren't being told the truth. We All say. of the, you know what yeah, I mean? It's, yeah, they weren't yeah. quite lying, they just weren't quite telling the truth. Right. Right. <laughs> and then being an oil man, I realized that in Vietnam, we were fighting for Royal, du Royal Dutch Shell. We weren't fighting for anything else but oil, because there's a lot of oil out there. Mm -hmm. The same thing mm. as we're fighting today in Afghanistan and Iraq, it's mm. about the oil. You know, mm. Don't ever anybody tell you it's for freedom. Yeah. It's about oil. And, okay. and oil is important, I'm wrong, I understand. Right. You know, I'm not saying it's bad. Right. So I got very disillusioned and I come mm -hmm. back from Vietnam in 1973 and my poor dad, the guy that always told me to go to school, get good grades and get a high paying government job and get my PhD, so I get my GS 25 million rating, whatever they right, go, those right. government guys go by, you know. <laughs> well, he gets fired. And oh, so back no. in the 70s, my old man's 50 years old mm. and I'm just 25 at the time. He's fired because he ran for governor against his boss or lieutenant governor against his boss. And he ran as a Republican in what people call the People's Republic of Hawaii. You know, it, it is so labor union intense. Nothing mm -hmm. wrong with labor unions, you know, but they're, they have their own agenda. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But my dad makes the mistake of running against them in a, in a democratic state. He gets wiped out. He goes back to his boss, the governor, and says, would you give me my job back? The governor says, you're a loser, you're mm. gone. So my dad was uh, blacklisted from uh, ever working again in the state of Hawaii, you know, never, because you, you can't work here, you're a persona non grata. So my dad couldn't find a job, even though he was hard working, good man, mm. PhD, you know, all the stuff, Yeah, he couldn't get a job. So here I'm 25 years old and I go, obviously that stuff doesn't work. Mm. And I could sense these changes coming in the world, you know, and like in 1971, Nixon took us off the gold standard. Mm -hmm. 1974 was the start of these 401ks. Mm. And so being an economics major, basically, and a historian, I could see the changes coming. So today we have Social Security is bankrupt. Mm. Medicare is gonna go first. Mm. Uh, there's, no, there's less and less job security. You know, the, and the government is now allowing big corporations not to fund the pensions mm. of the workers. Mm -hmm. So uh, back, back in the 1970s, I could see these changes coming. So that's mm. a long answer of saying, I realized that uh, I better learn to take care of myself mm. and not depend upon the government or a big corporation to take care of me. And I could also see that for millions of people of the baby boom generation my age, that was, we're going, we're going to be the first generation that really realizes that uh, social security, you know, the Japanese don't call it social security, they call it, ah, uh, so, so, security. Like a little so, so, security today, you know? <laughs> Medicare, but yeah. Medicare is your most dangerous thing because we all, health is expensive today, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it or not, you know, it, it costs money. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's shot. And then pension plans are shot because mm -hmm. they, because of fall of the stock market. Mm -hmm. And these 401ks, in my opinion, they're better than nothing, but not much better. Mm. So with all of that, I feel kind of compelled to go and educate and you know, teach people to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't listen to Wall Street. Don't listen to the pundits who say, you know, we'll take care of you because you know how they take care of you. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now, you say that you must pay a price to be wealthy. What kind of price does one have to pay to be wealthy? Well... I always say that you need two professions today, you know, one for you to work in. Mm -hmm. So let's say I'm a, you know, work in construction or I work in whatever, like I'm an author. Mm -hmm. But the second profession is my money. My money also needs a profession. Mm. So one of the prices a person needs to pay is you need your education not only for what you do mm -hmm. for money, <clears throat> but you also need an education for your money to work hard for you. Mm. And so there's so many people who are focusing on their career or they go back to school to then get a higher paying job, mm -hmm. but that's only half the picture. They're not focusing on their money working hard. Interesting. And so I learned to have my money work hard so I don't have to work hard for the rest of my life. And um, <clears throat> I think people have their priorities backwards. They focus on career first, money mm -hmm. second. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be 65 and find out that you're out of money and out of time. Mm -hmm. So you've really mm -hmm. got to look at both today. And that's what makes it hard. The price is you have to get educated or you know, get a job with the post office, which is not bad, you know, right. or, or the police department, and you right. get a 20-year retirement. That's, that's the other price you pay. 
that's a high price too because there's a type price of time that you can't get back. Yeah, if you really want to be a policeman, great. You really want to be a fireman, great. You really want to be a postal service, great. You really want to be a public servant, great. But if you don't want to be, then you've sold your soul for money, and uh, yes. that's, that's another price you pay. <laughs> Would you say that also in that model that it's okay if you're in an industry that you really, really love? Like, say social work. Social workers don't right. make a lot of money, but right. if they had another level of education for their money, they can still do what they love to do, yeah. but don't have to worry about that's where they're getting their source of income and wealth from. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you have two professions, you can work for nothing and still get rich. Beautiful. Uh, you know. Talk to me about how important mindset is. I mean, it's, it's really, that's what the whole gist of this is. It's really about opening up your consciousness and moving to another, allowing some new information in that you've never been exposed to, definitely weren't taught in school, right. can't find in, in, in your church. Uh, well, maybe the, the pastor has, but <laughs> not the congregants. So it's really about mindset. Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, how many people have heard work hard, save money, get out of debt, <clears throat> I don't do any of those things. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You called. I remember my first interview with you. You said, I'm a lazy millionaire and I'm lazy by default. Yeah. And you like it that way. Yeah, because the lazier I am, the more money I make. Talk to me, Robert. Talk to, I love it when you talk dirty to me. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> how, do you be la how do you become lazy and make money at the same time? Well, you just have to you know, almost question what you've been told by a lot of people. For, let's, mm. let's look at saving money. Why is saving money bad? You know why it's bad? It's because after 1971, if you look at history, mm -hmm. Nixon took us off the gold standard. Fundamentally what that meant was the boys, which is the Federal Reserve and the government, mm -hmm. they can print as much money as they like. Mm. So that you're working hard, you're, if you put money in the bank, it's going down in value, it's not going up. Fascinating. I heard that the Fed prints 430 or 38 million dollars per day. Yeah, it's, it's, it's 50 million an hour we're losing right now wow. as a nation. Wow. So they, they just print. That means your dollar is worth less and less and less and less. Mm. And, and then they say, there's no inflation. I said, have you been past the gas pump lately? <laughs> have you been looking at the cost of housing? Yeah. You know, I mean, oil again and construction. Yeah. Look at who's making the money. Fascinating. Because you know, they're printing so much money right now. Yes, yes. So that's why one of the things I, I learned was that you look at it, so I had to learn how to have my money work hard for me. So mm. this is the, this, there's so many uh, that subject question you ask. Mm. If I work hard for money physically, I am taxed at the highest rates possible. Mm. If mm -hmm. my money works hard for me, I'm taxed at the lowest rates possible. So if you begin to understand that everything our parents, and they innocently mm -hmm. said, you know, work hard, go to school, and it's not a bad advice, but it's not rich advice. Mm. So th well said. those are the problems. So I learned to have my money work hard for me. One of the, one of the reasons I like you know, businesses and real estate and all that, it's not my money. I just borrow the money. Mm -hmm. So everybody says debt is bad. Well, there's good debt and bad debt. Talk so, to me about that. I remember you saying that, that there's yeah. a difference between good debt and bad debt. Well, bad debt is like your home, your car, going, you know, buying clothes mm -hmm. with your credit cards and all that. It's consumer debt. Mm -hmm. Not that a house is bad, not that a car is bad, not that you, can, you should be closed. You can yes, can't run around naked with a credit card. But <laughs> for some reason, bad debt is the easiest to get. Isn't that interesting? Fascinating. How about that? And good debt is debt that makes you rich. That's the hardest to get. Mm. Now, the problem with being deeply in debt with bad debt is you don't get the good debt. Mm. Because, because of a lack of education, most people leave school, and they don't know if there's good debt or bad debt. They load up on bad debt. Mm. And then, then they never get ahead because they're always trying to get out of bad debt, get out of bad debt, mm. get better, where they don't even know this good debt. So one of the reasons you want to have a good credit rating is like for me is that when I, you know, I just, uh, just lost a deal, but I had a $4 million office building I was buying. Mm -hmm. The bank was going to give me $4 million. Mm. So I was going to own the building for free because for, I could find it. Mm -hmm. You know, it took me, a, took me a day to find the thing. Mm -hmm. So it was a $4 million deal. I was going to make 10000 a month. I was going to borrow all the money. Do you know what Amazing. I mean? And I ask people who are savers, how long would it take you to borrow? I mean, how long would it take you to save $4 million? Mm. And mm -hmm. for most people, you know, it's forever. They'll never make it. How long does it take me to borrow $4 million? Two weeks. So I'm getting richer faster because I have good credit and I'm borrowing money for real things that make me richer and richer. Okay. Uh, okay. You know, I, I have my Bentley and I have my Ferrari yeah. and I have my Porsche. I like my yeah. toys. 
but those things are stupid. You know? <laughs> to go after uh, first <coughs> and accumulate yeah. bad debt with. Yeah. Yeah, I remember um, you telling the story, and uh, it was about your wife, Kim. You wanted to buy your Porsche, and I think you still have that Porsche. Yeah. You wanted to buy the Porsche. You talked to your wife, Kim, and said, baby, I'd like to buy this Porsche. And she said, okay, well, you need to find an asset that buys to pay Porsche. for it. That's correct. And not pay cash for it or not That's pay right. it through credit. Talk to me about that, that well, process. There, there was a poor. I had, the Porsche was 50000 and I had 50000 in cash. Mm -hmm. If I had bought the Porsche, I'd lose the fifty, mm. and the Porsche would go down and be it. And so I took that fifty and I put together a syndication. We bought these mini storages with it. The mini storage then put one thousand dollars in my pocket every month with the fifty thousand. Mm. The one thousand paid for the Porsche. Nice. Okay. So today, then I so so. And you I, still have the asset. I still have the mini storage, and guess what? The mini storage went up in value, and I borrowed out the fifty thousand. So I have my fifty thousand. I have the mini storage. I have the thousand dollars a month cash flow, and I have my Porsche. If I had bought the Porsche, that might be all I have today. Beautiful. It is a matter of it understanding priorities. Yes. That's so that's the price you have to pay. Is you have to sometimes stop listening to these people who will tell you go to school, get good good, good grades, good job, work hard, save money, and get out of debt. Because mm. that's really a loser's mentality. Now you say what, let's talk a little bit more about debt. There are people who unfortunately are in bad debt and yeah. have bad debt. Yeah. So will these principles apply to them? Will it work for them? Well, not not until they find out why they're in bad debt. Mm. You know, I mean, if if they if they're Imelda Marcos, it's not over. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> Hang it up. As uh, Warren Buffett says, if you can't control your emotions, you can't control your money. Mm. And there's a lot of people who just can't control. You know, like I was uh, I was us in Las Vegas. I don't gamble at all. I was lost in Las Vegas. I said, come cash your paycheck here at the casino. <laughs> <laughs> that poor guy doesn't have a chance. You know, not he's at not all. Gonna, he's not going to get out of there. No. No. You know, the guy's already in there thinking that he's going to get past those slot machines or the blackjack yeah. table or whatever. You don't have a prayer. There's bad habits where you go, you go bid on the ponies or whatever people do. You don't have a prayer. You know, you're watching the Philippe Matthews shows. Now, let me just give you my opinion. He is the Oprah of Internet. What that means is that he is getting together the biggest audience of people that want to make a difference in the world. And if that's you, you keep watching. Hi, this is Philippe Matthews, host of The Philippe Matthews Show. To subscribe to The Philippe Matthews Show newsletter and to keep up to date on news and events, send an email request to subscribe at thepmshow.com. Back with the phenomenal Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. We were talking about mindset, and let's talk a little bit more about mindset, but let's talk about why people have a difficult time opening up to the concepts of wealth, the actuality of wealth, and here it is. Here is your, here is your ticket to, to uh, heaven, if you will, and they don't take it. <laughs> they don't take it. They don't do it. They just sit there. You know, it's like that old story about, you know, uh, the woman who died. God sent a helicopter and a boat and all that. She gets to heaven and says, well, why didn't you save me? Duh. Why are we in this kind of cadumbo state where we just don't take advantage of what we have? People come from other parts of the other areas of the world to our country and take full advantage of the opportunity here and make more money than we do. And we work for them. Yeah. Well, that's a good question, you know, because my, my friend says <clears throat> everybody wants to go to heaven. But no one wants to die. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought that was kind of funny. That was good. <laughs> so, uh, so how do we get to heaven while we're still here on the planet? Well, it's a couple of points, you know. It's like, and then I'll always ask the question: Why doesn't our school system teach us about money in school? Yeah, you know, they teach us scholastic education, you know, reading and writing, which is very important. <clears throat> teach us professional education, become a doctor or a plumber, mm -hmm. secretary. But they don't teach us anything about money. And the thing is, the common denominator, whether we're rich or poor, or mm -hmm. dumb or stupid, or smart, we all use money. Yes. But for some reason, the National Ed Education Association, and the teachers, and the powers to be think that money is an evil subject also. So mm -hmm. they don't teach it. So naturally, people are afraid because they don't have a fundamental education on money. Mm -hmm. And so then they're sold to by the banks that tell you to save money 
and Wall Street and, and real estate brokers and insurance brokers. You know, mm. my, my dad said the reason they call them brokers is because they're broker than you are. <laughs> 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 and, nice. And, and I like my brokers. I'm only making fun. You know, have a sense of humor. I like my bank. They're coming at you. They're coming yeah. after you. <laughs> but you have to know how to use their services. Yes. But anyway, the big reason is this. It has to do with the promised land. Mm. It does it with the 80-20 rule. Mm. Everybody hears about that? So, mm -hmm. so 20% 20, 20 of you says, oh, yeah, I can see the promised land. Mm. But it's the 80% of you that's afraid yes. or uneducated. So it goes back to the 80-20 rule. If you can't shift the 80% of fear, negativeness, fear, mm -hmm. or doubt mm -hmm. into the 20%, you don't make it. Mm. And so most people don't make it because cynicism or doubt and lack of education and your friends who hold you back mm -hmm. or, or don't push you forward or you, you know, one thing, I, and I went to church for a long time and I always noticed in church, it was, they never said it, but the underlying statement was poor people went to heaven and rich people went to hell. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you know what I mean? There was always an underlying message. Absolutely. In Even in our, in our childhood, all of the stories, the villain was the rich guy. That's correct. And I've always wondered, like in school, they studied Silas Marner or Scrooge. You know, it's always the rich guy is the bad guy. Yet if you look at, you know, like last year alone, I, I probably wrote a check for almost $5 million in taxes alone. So mm. I pay a lot. I made a lot of money. But, you know, <laughs> the tax, that's a lot of money. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I pay a lot in taxes, uh, with donations to charities and all this. But people like to see the rich as evil many of the times. But a big reason is they cannot convert the 80% of doubt and fear mm. into the 20%. So they can see mm -hmm. the promised land, the 20%, mm -hmm. but lack of education, doubt, and fear holds them back. And then, so somehow you've got to make that leap. And a couple of points I say to people, if you want to make that leap, it really depends upon your spouse, or if you're married, you know, your husband or wife. If your husband or wife is holding you back, you probably don't have a chance. Mm. So it's a journey you make together, because it's not a, it's not a get rich quick game. It's a it's a journey over your lifetime. Mm -hmm. and I wouldn't have made it without my wife, you know. Kim, yes, yes. And the second thing is your friends. You know, if your friends are drug dealers, you're probably in drugs. I mean, you know what I mean? The, yeah, the, you are who you hang out with. Absolutely, without question. And then the third part is are, are your advisors. Mm. You know, like is your accountant an idiot, or is mm. your accountant aggressive? You know, so or if you're an accountant, an idiot, and they don't even know they're an idiot. Yeah. Which is or, worse or more dangerous. Or, yeah, you know, the first thing I ask my accountant, I say, do you invest? Because if they don't invest, then they're not my kind of man or woman. Because mm. you know, they're, they're different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's different kinds of accountants. Then the attorneys. You can have good attorneys and bad attorneys. So it's, it's and a banker. You know, there's a ba I can just call my banker up and I can get several million dollars and do what I have to do. Mm -hmm. But it's taking time to develop these friendships and all that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So those are the things that really count. So that's the 80%. Okay. You see, it's, it's who are you hanging out with, what's, what's your education, who are your advisors, and who your friends are. If you can convert that into, you know, wealth thinking ideas or aggressive or, you know, risk taking ideas, you'll you'll make it across. It the becomes a machine, thing. a system yeah. that runs on itself. But if you're 80% of the pack of losers, you know, like I went to school with. <laughs> <laughs> You're hardcore, Robert. I know. You know, please, please hold back a little bit. <laughs> <I know. laughs>
I want to talk about that because I'm, I'm happy that we're on free TV. One of the things that has happened uh, over the uh, last few years, more so in print than on television, is that some of the media people have been, uh, let's say, unkind, uh, misquoting you uh, in many different uh, ways. And because I know the man and I know the mission, I'm saying, well, where the hell did this come from? How do they do their research? If they, I mean, if they did a little homework, they would know these principles of sound, and they work. You don't, you don't get as rich as you by, you know, selling a bunch of BS for so long from 1997 to now. So obviously you're doing something right. Uh, you said something interesting, that the papers and the journalists are owned by advertisers right. and, the, and the television station, stations. So they're censored by default. That's correct. If a newspaper, and this starts with the Los Angeles Times, New York Times, and all, if they say something their advertisers don't do, they get shut down. Mm. And so now these big newspapers, they are censored by determined by the advertisers. The same as this Dr. Atkins, you know, this carbohydrate revolution and mm. you know, eat meat and everything I like and all this <laughs> stuff. Well, that was 25 years ago. He came out, and the more popular he got, the more the media came after him. Yes. And I, I don't mention names, but one of the famous television shows, I, I noticed, you know, the hosts just attacking Atkins. I was going, why are they attacking Atkins? Mm. And then right after this, and a good best to you each morning, Kellogg's, cornflakes, you know, and, <laughs> and Fig Newtons and all this stuff. Ah. And I realized all the sponsors produce carbohydrates. You know, you don't find, you don't, you don't find Gosh, Joe's man. meat market selling on that thing. Or, That's right. <laughs> so all the guys who had car, the bread industry is hurting, pasta's hurting, and all those. And those are the guys that advertise. So that's why they went after Atkins. And the guy's not even cold yet. The guy's dead. And now they're still attacking him, Amazing. saying he was overweight with high blood pressure and all this. And, you know, that's, and that's the thing. I, you know, I write about my other, mm. this book, Who Took My Money, mm. is in Ask a Journalist. We, freedom of speech doesn't mean we have to tell the truth. Mm. Do you see, just because, mm. you know, when I read a financial from a, from a stock company or for a company and all this, they can't lie. In fact, accounting is just not a lie, but one big distortion. You've got to understand how the numbers are making the story look good or making the story look bad. Mm -hmm. So uh, many, many real estate investors, they'll actually take a, what's called a pro forma, mm. which is, you know, BS, blue sky. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll actually buy the property based upon the pro forma, which mm. is basically a sales document. Mm. It's not true. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to lie in this country. I mean, that's what the freedom of speech allows. And that's why this whole thing, you know, where's the weapons of mass destruction mm -hmm. or Clinton not having sex with who and mm -hmm. all of this stuff. This, this country has gotten to the point where it's okay to lie. Mm. In fact, they, people expect to be lied to. It's almost like, don't wake me from this dream. Mm. You know, don't mm. tell me anything's wrong with Social Security. Don't tell me something's wrong with Medicare. Let's lie state a state me. of denial here. Yeah, yeah, denial. Just please lie to me. Fascinating. And I think that's the problem is that people have to demand the truth sometimes. Yes, yes. Well, let's talk about, let's further this, but let's talk about the next generation. We know where we're at as adults, but there's kids and there's teens mm. that we can get to before their mind has been completely proselytized and predetermined that they're going to work for someone else for a living and, work and, and develop the plantation mentality. I understand now that you have the cash flow game, which is is played all over the world, but you have one called uh, 202. It's an e-game, and it's played online. And kids, and you have one also for kids called uh, Cash Flow for Kids or Smart Kid and Smart Kids at Home. Talk to me about this game and getting out of the rat race, which is really what the game is dedicated to. It's like mon Monopoly on steroids, really. It's what it right. is, you know. Well, ca Cash Flow was the first game that's patented mm -hmm. property. Of again. course. It better be. <laughs> yeah, the first game that taught uh, accounting and investing simultaneously. See, accounting is the most boring subject on planet Earth, <laughs> and investing is the most frightening. So you put the two mm. of them together, you learn you learn how to have fun because it's it's just a game. And the reason the financial statement is so important is my rich dad often said to me is my teachers never asked me for my report card yet. Mm. My teachers never asked me if I had good grades. I've never been asked what school I went to. Mm. If you're playing the game of money. What they want to see is your financial statement. And less than 1% of Americans have a financial statement. Mm -hmm. They have credit applications and they have tax returns, but they don't actually have financials. And so if you don't have financials, mm -hmm. the banker already knows you're a sucker and a loser. You're not really playing this game anyway. Mm -hmm. That's why all corporations have to have audited, I mean, all 
publicans have to have audited financials. Mm -hmm. They still lie through them. Mm -hmm. But it's part of the game of life. And so what we created with these games was to teach young people and old that this is the document is, which is your report card for your life as an adult. Because when I go to my banker today and I show my financials, three years audited, they go, how much money do you want? Mm -hmm. But if I walk in there and all I have is bills, they go, well, sorry, but you know, we'll, we'll talk to somebody else. So the game was designed to teach people financials plus investing. So we have a game that goes for free. That's all the money we make. We give it to f school systems throughout the world for free over the web. It's a game with a curriculum K through 12. Mm. The reason we have to give it away for free because the schools won't pay for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, and they think it's an evil thing anyway, a lot of them. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. some, many school teachers are now starting to adopt it. Mm -hmm. We have a college course for the, the Maricopa Community College System, so which they're adopting now, which has been very widely. But the, the la thing I'm most happy about is a game called Cashflow 202, the electronic version. Mm -hmm. It's the first game that actually puts it all together. Mm -hmm. And why it's all together, there's fundamental investing and there's technical. Technical goes up and down. For the very first time, you can play the game mm -hmm. and go up and down and all, and it just blows your brain apart. But mm. you're playing it with fake money. Mm. So you'll actually learn the game playing online, people throughout the world, and you just, you just it's like taking your brain to the gym and just training it, training it, training it till you, til you change the way you think. Absolutely, and that's, and that's what that's what we designed to do. We don't sell investments, but we teach people to be smart money managers. Well, my friend, you are a blessing and have been a blessing Thank in you. my life since I've come to know you back in 1997 and, and the many times that we've talked on EmpowerMag.com. I wish you the best of prosperity and I wish your mission to, to really totally populate and dominate the planet. Come back to us the next time you're in town to the Philippe Matthews Show and we'll help spread this word more and more. Thank Blessings you. to you, my friend. Congratulations on your success. Thank you so much. Thank you.